to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Oh, wow, hey, nobody. I am. Oh, one person is excited to be here. Good. Well, we're excited that you're here. Um, and I just invite you to uh, clear your mind this morning. Let's just continue to worship him. Uh, you know, I don't know if y'all uh, watch the news, but there's some pretty crazy things going on in our world right now, and things just keep getting crazier and crazier. But you know what? God is still in control. And so I just want you to take comfort in that this morning, that no matter what you're going through, no matter what's happening with you or overseas or in different countries or even in this country, that he is still the king and he is still on the throne this morning and he is still faithful. So let's just continue to worship him.
song always wipes me out, that last part of it. He has paid the highest price. He has redeemed us. We are redeemed. And, and what more could we do that just offer up our worship and praise to him and, and just give him all the glory because he is our Savior. He's our Redeemer. Amen. The sun cannot compare to the glory of your love. There is no shadow in your presence. No mortal man would dare to stand before your throne. Before the Holy One of Heaven. It's only So There's nothing worth more 
what a, what a shame it would be if we wasted this moment. You know, it says in the Bible where two or more are gathered, there I am in their midst. And so he's here this morning, and he's not going to force himself on you. He's not going to make you worship him. He's not going to say, make you uh, cry out to him and, and ask him for help. But he's here this morning, and so why, why would we waste it? And so if you have something going on in your life, like so many of us do, nothing's too small for God. There's nothing too small going in your life that he does not care. He loves you so much and he cares about just the, the smallest details in your life, the things that are going on in your life. And so just for this one moment before we move on, let's just take advantage of his presence being here with us. It's so amazing to think that the God that created everything is just in this place and he's taking time to come meet you where you're at right now. He's taking time to just come and minister to you. That's so amazing. And so let's just be in this moment and let's not waste this moment. Let's not let him pass us by. Let's reach out and let's touch the hem of his garment this morning and just cry out to him and worship him because he's worthy of all honor and all praise. just thank you for your presence, Father. I just ask that your presence would just move freely through this place, Father. 
you know the need each one of us have here, Father, and I just ask that your Holy Spirit would touch each and every one, Father, that whatever uh, th they're going through right now, Father, that they would just give it to you, even in this moment right now, Father, and that uh, they would feel a physical change, Father, that they would feel peace, Father, that they would just feel relief right now in this moment, Father, as we're worshiping you and as we're in your presence, Father. We just thank you for what you're doing in this church and what you're doing in each and every one of our lives. And we just ask that you continue to move freely, Father, even when we leave this place, Father, that we can feel your Holy Spirit um, just during this week, Father, and as we continue on, Father. And we just thank you, Father, for your presence. We thank you for your goodness. Amen. You guys can be reseated at this time. And isn't God so good? Man, I love worshiping him. It's one of my favorite things to do. And I, I love that we get to come here and we get to do it together and um, just be in his presence. It's so amazing. You know, we have um, our brothers and sisters in Christ in different countries that they don't get the same luxury that we have. They don't get to come and just sit here and, and be in this nice warm building and, and gather with other believers and worship. So I, I, I think it's so awesome. So um just two quick announcements for you guys. Um, members, um, we have our annual business meeting coming up. It's going to be on March 7th. It's going to be at 7 p.m. here at the church. So if you're a member, please come. It's when we discuss all our church business, our finances, and um, other church business that we have. So we'd love um, if, if you are a member, if you could please attend. And then we also have one more announcement. Ms. Jerry announced this last week, but I just wanted to remind you that our women's ministry, we are collecting items um, where we are, um, we have adopted a community where we're going out and we're providing um, just um, gift bags and trying to bless some of the elderly that are in um, an elderly community. And so there is a box in the back. And if you came in today, I think Miss Jerry gave you a handout that has information on it. But if you need further information, you can just get with Miss Jerry or even Miss Juanice over here. Wave your hand, Miss Juanice. You can get with Miss Juanice too, and and uh, she'll um, be able to give you more information. So, without further ado, Amen. Aren't you thankful we can trust him this morning? Amen. Victoria was talking a minute ago about her favorite thing to do is come to. To come to a church and worship God. I know her second thing, her second favorite thing to do is listen to her dad speak in church. Can I get an amen? <laughs> I'm so thankful we can trust him. He has proven himself to be faithful. The Old Testament writer said, Great is your faithfulness. And we're living in such crazy times and and uh, we don't we don't know who we can trust anymore. Because so many times people have let us down and, and people have injured us. And the ones that injure us the most are the ones uh, that are closest to us from time to time. And, but I'm thankful today that we can experience his peace and his hope. Aren't you thankful we have hope in this crazy, crazy world? Turn to, some, turn to about two people this morning and say, are you crazy yet? <laughs> oh, Oh, my gosh. Somebody told me one time, said, Donald, you're driving me crazy. I said, it's going to be a short drive. Amen. Can I get amen on that? <laughs> crazy, crazy world out there, but I'm thankful that we can, we can trust him. We're finishing up our series called Kiss. Turn to somebody and give him a good kiss this morning. Kiss. And uh, Matthew chapter 18, verse 2 through 4. And calling to him a child. He put him in the midst of them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. KISS is an acronym, and that's sort of been our, our subject. Keep it simple, stupid. Not that I'm calling anybody here stupid, but you know, the shoe fits. Okay, let's not go there. But it, it was, uh, it, it, you know, the acronyms we used for several different, in several different ways, but it was uh, made popular in the 60s by the U.S. Navy. And it was a principle that states that most systems work best if they are kept simple rather than made complicated. Therefore, simplicity should be the key goal in design and unnecessary complexity should be avoided. Life can be very complex. 
And many of you have, many of you are going through some really difficult times in your life. And our problems oftentimes can be very complex. They can be very difficult. Life can have so many moving parts and we're trying to figure out which way to go and where to turn. But I'm thankful this morning that even though a lot of times our problems are very complicated, sometimes the, the solutions are very simple. At least the first step can be very simple in beginning to unwind and unravel all of the all of the drama and everything that's going on in our lives. I like the, the, I like the, the uh, idea or the concept of simplicity. Keep it simple, senor. Well, well, th- well if I got to find another word for stupid, I don't like to call people stupid, but keep it simple. And I like the fact that the way Jesus taught us, uh, I've been asked before, probably you have too, if people find out you go to church a lot or whatever, uh, people want to know, well, who's right? You know, which, which church is right? You know, the message that Jesus had was, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love, for an, love one for another. But the, the message of many churches is not the message of Jesus. The message of many churches today is we're right. We are the ones that are right. Message of some pastors well, I'll value you as long as you come to my church. So, I mean, the message is they, <laughs> they're a little bit off kilter. But I love the simplicity of just simply following him. The whole thing about serving God, it's about relationships. It can all be summed up into one word, relationships. It's not about having a bunch of hoops. You know, there's some people to be a part of their life. You constantly have to jump, jump through hoops. I'm at the age I don't jump as much anymore. I have no problem with the jump. It's the landing. I don't always stick. How many of you ever fell down? <laughs> you fall down. <laughs> How many of you have ever had to call 911? Help, I've fallen and I can't get up. <laughs> but if you're not there yet, hang on. How many of you, it's just a struggle to get out of bed in the morning? Come on, people. Struggle is real. Amen. And, and often, oftentimes, oftentimes the life of faith in this this, this relationship that we can have with Christ, it, it can become so complicated. So which church is right? And so there's so many rules and there's so many traditions. There's so many things that you have to do to stay in favor. You realize that so many of the denominations, the denominations are man-made. I don't have any issue with any denominations. Any church that's preaching Jesus and loves him, they're my brother and sister in Christ. Amen? So, so there's not just one church. There's not just one way of doing things except for his way, Right? But it's just to, to, to simply, and Jesus, to, to make this point, he, he took a little child. He said, unless you become like the, this little child, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So I love the concept of just the relationship, having a relationship. Two relationships, a relationship with God and a relationship with others. That's the reason why Jesus said, love God with all of your heart, love your neighbor as yourself. And in those two commandments, all of the law, and all of the prophets, all the Old Testament is fulfilled in those two commandments. You know, if you follow those two commandments, you'll follow the Ten Commandments. Some of those Ten Commandments are in dealing with our relationship with God. You know, like, you shall have no other God before me. Don't make any graven images for me. Then there's another one that says, you know, that says, uh, do not covet your neighbor's wife. Well, if you see my neighbor's wife, it's not much of a temptation. Can I get an amen? Oh, that was so wrong. But if you follow, <laughs> if you follow, <laughs> if you follow those, two, those two commandments, love God with all of your heart, love your neighbors yourself, you'll fulfill the Ten Commandments. Not only the Ten Commandments, all of the commandments, everything that God requires of you. It's guys, it's all about relationship, and it's a relationship not built on the threat of going to hell. If you were raised like I was, I was sent to hell every week. I'm surprised. I'm, <laughs> you know, I survived that. But uh, church tradition, it was pretty rough. But I'm thankful this morning that God so loved the world that he gave his own son. He loved us so much. And I'm thankful, I'm thankful for his love. So most of us probably have, how many of you would say you have trust issues today? How many of you have ever like walked into a car dealership and said, I'm going to believe everything they tell me. <laughs> I am going to fully trust. I'm going to fully trust them. Now, we love car dealers, don't get me wrong, but uh, they've been known to sell a few items o- over the years. But, uh, you know, sometimes the most, I hate to say this, but sometimes the most untrustworthy people are pastors. Can I get amen there? Because, I mean, you know, we're just, we're just human. 
You know, it really bothers me. It really bothers me when I see people in the church that are hypocrites. But you know what bothers me even more? Is when I realize I was the hypocrite. Oh, you didn't have to say amen on that, Jim. Now, just there's, there's, some, there's some points I make, I want to hear crickets. I don't hear an amen from you, bro. No, no, I, you know, we're not hypocritical in the sense we're trying to deceive anybody, but sometimes there's an inconsistency in the life that I'm supposed to live and the life that I do live. Not because I'm trying to be a hypocrite, but you know, hey, guys, he's not finished with me yet. Aren't you thankful for that? He's not finished with us yet, and so I'm thankful he didn't bring us this far to leave us. And while he's in the process of working in our lives, and we have this relationship with him, and we just have this simple trust in him, he's working through our lives, he's perfecting us, how many of you know that the, the way that God is the most effective way for God to work in your life is through pain and through sorrow and through grief? Did you know that? It's through those difficult times. The guy that gets on TV and talks about, well, I believe in favor and I, I believe in blessing, but this, this life that supposedly is presented to potential believers, boy, if you'll follow Jesus, there's nothing but favor and blessing and good times. Boy, that's just, that's not, the, that's not the gospel Jesus preached. Jesus said in John chapter 16, verse 33, he said, in this world, you're going to have trouble. Now, if you like the older versions, King James Version says tribulation. Turn to somebody and say tribulation. That's a scary word right there. Tribulation. That, that sounds so much more scarier than trouble, but it means the same thing. In this world, you're going to have trouble. In this world, you're going to have tribulation. But Jesus said these words. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. So there's wars and rumors of wars. There's pestilences, which is epidemics, in all these places. And Jesus said, all these things are signs of my coming. But he said, see that your heart is not troubled. Don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me, for in my Father's house are many. Is it mansions? Is it rooms? I, I'll know which version you're reading by how you quote that verse. That he's preparing a place for us. To have, to have, guys, just a simple trust, which just means a firm belief in the reliability, the truth, the ability or strength of someone or something. God wants us to have a simple trust in him. My children, my grandchildren, rather, get into that age where it's not as easy for me to lie to them. Yes, as a pastor, I do lie, but only when I think I can get away with it. So my grandkids are awesome because now, especially Presley, she's getting to that age where she is able to use critical thinking skills, which you don't learn in college universities anymore because you're just taught to, to basically believe what the professor tells you. But critical thinking skills that she is beginning to have a, uh, how, can I, how can I say this? She is able to detect when I'm not really telling the truth. And most of the time, it's, you know, I'm just messing with them. I'm having fun, just messing around with my grandkids. But to be able to have simple trust, and, and just, just like a child, because most of the time when a child views you as trustworthy, they'll just believe what, what, uh, they'll believe what you say. And can you imagine living your life? So many times, instead of w living with it's this incredible peace that passes all understanding, Jesus said, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. But yet a lot of Christians, they're not really experiencing that peace uh, like we should. Many times we are allowing the, the storm on the outside and the upset on the outside and the chaos on the outside to get on the inside. I can't control what happens around me. There's so many things I cannot control but I can't control what gets in me. I can't control, you know, like that, those disciples, they were in that boat and it was the storm was just being thrown about and Jesus walks out on the water and he does say, peace, be still. But you know, there are times that he calms the storm. There's other times he calms his child. And I'm thankful for that peace that passes all understanding. But instead of living in that peace and the hope that we have and this joy unspeakable, many times we we're looking at the storm. Peter, as long as he had his eyes on Jesus, he walked on water. As long as your eyes on Jesus, you'll walk on top of your circumstances. As long as your eyes upon Jesus, you're going to have strength and peace and hope. But you get your eyes off of him and on the storm. 
And you feel the wind, and you become aware of the wind, and, and the, the waves, and the winds that, that is contrary, and the storms all around us, and you focus upon that, and you'll sink just like Peter did. You won't have that peace. It passes all understanding. But we can trust him. And I, I believe he wants us to trust him like a little child, just to live. Could you imagine waking up every morning thinking, you know what, Lord, I don't know what I'm going to face today, but I know that you're going with me, and I'm just going to live in peace. How many of you had a couple of days or maybe a day this past week where you kind of lost your peace? You kind of lost your joy. How many of you lost your mind a little bit? <laughs> I know I see some of your posts on Facebook. God bless you. Bless, let's, let's pray. Yeah, I understand, you know, many times we go through those, we go through the upset and the turmoil and all those things. But could you imagine to just, just thinking and being, have, have the ability just to remind yourself when, when it's like everything's going crazy around you, just say, you know what, God, I don't understand this. I'm just going to trust you. I'm just going to believe. Lord, I know that you're going to work all things out for my good. I know, God, that this doesn't look good. This is not a great situation. It's not comfortable for me to go through. I don't even know that your comfort is not his number one priority. Did you know that? Your comfort, your happiness is not his number one priority. He's working in your life to make you stronger, to make you wiser, to make you more compassionate, to make you an overcomer, to make you an overcoming child of the king. Can I get an amen on that? Man, he's working. He's at work so we can rest in him. We can have simple trust in him. There's a, there's a great classic book called The Pursuit of God uh, written by A.W. Tozer. It's a little bit of a harder read. You know, you're getting some of those classics and, and uh, sometimes it's a little lost in translation. But it's a, it's a great book, The Pursuit of God. And chapter two of that book is entitled The Blessedness of Possessing Nothing. You see, it's all right. It's all right for us to possess things as long as they don't possess us. Jesus was talking about this, Matthew 6, when he says this, verse 19, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Far too often we make things important. We forget that we're supposed to love people and use stuff, but oftentimes we love stuff, we love things, and we just use people. We can't take that stuff with us. When you leave this world, you're not taking any of that stuff with you. All the stuff that we stress out about, the home or the car or whatever, possessions, all these things that sometimes they can become so valuable to us. We can't take those with us, but we can take people with us. People need to be the priority. And so when we lay our treasures up in heaven, we're not concerned about all these things down here because remember what Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things that you need will be added unto you. Now, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I believe we serve a God who blesses his children. And I do believe that he allows his favor to rest upon us. And I believe he'll meet every need. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. That is awesome. We have abundant life now, and we have eternal life when we die. And so that's just an amazing source of hope and strength that we have today, that we know that God is in control. But we, can, we cannot lay up treasures down here. Now, you know, when I was a kid, uh, they used to give us rewards in children's church for quoting verses. So they, everybody go home and quote a verse. So I would always come back and say, well, my favorite verse is John 11. I think it's John eleven thirty five. Jesus wept. Where's my candy? <laughs> See, I memorized that Bible verse. Jesus wept. And I would work on that all week. And I found another one that was really good, too. Okay, Donald, next week we want you to come with another verse. I got another one. Remember Lot's wife. Give me my candy. <laughs> Remember Lot's wife. But if you go back to the story of Lot's wife, you know, um, Lot and his family was the only righteous family in Sodom and Gomorrah. And when the angel came to rescue them and said, you know, this place is about to burn. You guys need to get out of here. But, but you need to leave, but don't turn back. Don't look back. And the Bible says that Lot's wife looked back because she was, she was sorrowful because she left so many possessions back. Now, I understand. I understand that some of you, some of you are hoarders. 
and, and you just pack everything away. Sometimes it's men. Uh, men will look at women and say, well, but go look at your garage. I mean, it can be just as bad for the man or your, your work shed, or you women have a she shed, three-story apartment that you've got all this stuff crammed into. You know, when my mom and dad passed away, they, they, they built a pretty good-sized house. God had blessed them, and they built a pretty good-sized house. It took, it took us months to go through and get rid of all that stuff. My dad, he, would, he, would, uh, he, found, he found the shopping channels. So uh, after he passed away, we were going through all their stuff, and we found packages that he had purchased years before he never opened. But that didn't stop him from buying other stuff. Well, Lot's wife had been on the home shopping network and some of the other stuff. She had her house full and crammed full of stuff. Her treasures were laid down here. And so when they left, when the angel rescued them, she turned around. And the Bible says she was turned into a pillar of salt. Boy, aren't you glad we live in the New Testament? That's some pretty, that's some pretty rough stuff. But do we trust him? Do we trust him like a little child? What about the small day-to-day -day things? But, you know, sometimes we, we struggle trusting him with the big things. And there are times in our lives, especially if it's something or someone that means so much to us, to put that person in God's hands, a loved one that has a terrible illness, and we're struggling. And oftentimes you can grieve for the loss of that person way years before you, you even actually lose them. And it's hard. We struggle to trust him. Because we say, Lord, that person, you know, that person means so, so much to me. Especially, uh, you know, one of the mo more difficult things that you go through is when you, when you lose a spouse. And, and so you struggle. And, and if, if it's an illness involved and, and, and you struggle trying to trust God and you try, you try to release that person. But I'll tell you what, if you learn to trust him in the small things. How many times have you go gotten... You've, got, you've given yourself a wedgie. I mean, you just got so upset about some small situation. You lost your mind. You told day was ruined. And then you get to the end of the day and you reflect on it. And you think, I really wasn't all that important. Because sometimes we can't, we struggle to trust him even in the small things. But if you learn to trust him in the small things, then you'll be able to trust him in the big things. That can be so, so difficult. So I got this picture up here. I, I saw this a while back. It's not, it's not a great masterpiece painting or anything, but I love this. It's called First Moments in Heaven. It kind of gives us a little perspective on what's really, really important. Now, I don't know about you guys. I still believe in heaven. Amen. I still believe Jesus is coming back. You say, well, the Bible says that. What's interesting, not only does the Bible say that Jesus is returning, did you also know in the Quran it says that Jesus Christ is returning to this earth? Now, there's a little bit different wording there, and we don't really accept the Quran as God's word. We receive, we, we receive uh, God's uh, word as the, as the Bible, but we know he's coming back. And when he comes back, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. But until that moment, every person, the apostle Paul said to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. So I know I have loved ones over there waiting for me. Be three surprises about heaven. Number one, you'll see people there you never thought was going to make it. Second surprise is there will, there will be people that won't be there that you thought were going to be there. And the third surprise for you is that you're there. You get amen? But this, this is a wonderful depiction of those, those first moments in heaven. Man, when you step out of this life and you step into the next life, Look, I know death is a scary thing to us. I, I understand there's a little bit of apprehension. It's a, it's a little nervous because it's like a one-way trip, baby. And as much as we have faith, I mean, we have not experienced it before. All we have to, 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 to take or stand up upon is what Jesus taught us. I don't know if you knew this or not, but what little we know about heaven comes from Jesus and his teachings. There was really no understanding of heaven. Before Jesus came. Yes, there were references to it in the Old Testament, but, but the, the knowledge that we have and, and, and the hope that we have came, it came from him and his, his teaching. So I'm thankful for him this morning. Understand that this is what heaven is all about. Understand that this is what laying your treasures up in heaven is all about. As a father, I hope my kid, I pray, hope and pray every day that my kids are there. And I just want to tell you something. If you're a parent here today, 
What priority are you, are you putting on trying to get your kids to heaven? Boy, okay, so you can, you can teach them how to be successful and make a lot of money. You can teach, teach them to live the good life. Maybe you're teaching them how to live, but are you teaching them how to die? And the most important thing for me is that every one of my kids would have an opportunity to receive Christ. No, I can't make them do anything. As adults, they have to make up their own mind. And God has kids. He doesn't have grandkids. But I'm so thankful this morning that it was a priority that I had for my kids. I drug them to church. Do your kids ever get on drugs? Yes, they had a drug problem. I drug them to church every Sunday. Every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, every Wednesday night, every funeral, every youth service, every singing, everything. I mean, we were at church. And that was something, uh, and they still hate me to this day. But so many things in our life that are not in our control. And it's an illusion that we have. That you are living with an illusion that everything, well, that's my spouse, that's my husband, that's my wife, that's my child, that's my job, that's my. No, no, you have to understand. It may be yours. They may be in your life now, but they can be taken at any moment. And it's hard to be able to release the loved ones and those things that are so important to us, to trust Him. There's a very simple test this morning that you can take. Just in your own mind, relax. We're not going to pass out a test to make you take it. Are you living, are you trusting Him today? A person that is frustrated, that's angry, that can't get along with anybody, a person, a person that's living in fear and worry and all those, that, that's a good indication you're not trusting Him. Now listen, we all struggle with anxiety, we all struggle with depression, we all struggle, there's no such thing as a super Christian that lives above it, we are all tested and tried in every way, and if you're struggling with that today, don't beat yourself up, get in line, you're not the Lone Ranger, but I'm just saying that at least if you are experiencing those things, if you're a person of trust, every day you're committing your life to Him, and you're saying, Lord, I don't understand this, Lord, my emotions, my toxic emotions, my fear, my worry, my anxiety, my, anxiety, my anger, all these things are trying to place thoughts in my mind that are, that are just out of control. But Lord, I am purposely and intentionally deciding I'm going to trust you. I'm not going to believe the lies of the enemy today. I'm going to stand upon his word. But if I'm living in peace and confidence because I have that simple trust in him. We're talking about simple trust, which leads us to simple humility. Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, Jesus said these words, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. When we walk in childlike trust, we can walk in humility. That is one of the missing graces in the lives of so many Christian graces in the lives of so many believers today. We're taught to be arrogant. We're taught to be, we're taught to be proud, proudful. Ameri we're Americans. We're gold medal winners, baby. We're better than the rest of the world. And I understand that we can be proud of our country and patriotic. But whether we are talking like an American or a Christian or whatever the case may be, we need to walk in humility before God. 33 times in the Bible it refers to the humility of Jesus. But not only did Jesus teach often on humility, just as important, he demonstrated it in his life. He had, he had a servant's heart. Philippians chapter 2 verse 4 says this, Do not look out only on your own interests, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. And when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. Jesus referred to himself in this way, Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Why is trust and humility so important in our lives? Because it enables us to surrender to the plan and the will of God. Even in the darkest of valleys. You remember what David said, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, or the newer translations render that, even though I walk through the darkest of valleys or the deepest valleys, you're with me, and I'm thankful for his presence in our lives. And when we trust him, when we just have that simple childlike trust, and you just make up your mind, you know, every morning when you wake up and you go through your gratitude list and you read your Bible, and then you're praying for your pastor every morning, and you're praying for your pastor every morning, 
You're praying for your pastor every morning? If I get 100%, I move on to the next point. And when you pray for your pastor every morning? You, sit, you guys sit back there complaining about your pastor, and you ain't prayed for him once. Can I get amen here? Some of you have a really guilty look on your face. <laughs> you pray for me, and I'll pray for you. And some of you, I don't know, I, you know, I know sometimes when you come to mind, I just take that as, as God wants me to pray for you. And I don't know what some of you are up to, but I'm thinking about you guys all the time. So lifting you up in prayer. But that simple trust and humility before God. Man, when you're going through, when you're going through something that has just devastated you, boy, you can, be, you can become bitter. You can become angry. You can become frustrated. You become mean-spirited. And sometimes, sometimes those tragedies that happen, they break up marriages. They destroy homes. Don't allow the problems and the trials that you're going through and the misunderstandings, don't allow them to divide, bring a division or drive a wedge in between you and your spouse. Allow it to bring you closer together. And that happens when we just say, Lord, I don't understand what's going on here. And this is hard and this is difficult and I don't understand your plan. But Lord, I'm going to trust you and I'm going to humble myself before you. See, pride will make you angry and pride will make you feel entitled. Like, oh, you know, I've had people tell me, this, well, I can't believe it. I went to church and then all these bad things started to happen to me. That's pride. That's pride. Because pride gives us a sense of entitlement. Well, no, I'm a child of God, so these things shouldn't be happening. And we can sit around saying, well, why me? Why me? I'm a terrible actor, but I'm trying to be very dramatic here. To, okay. Well, why say why me? Why don't you say why not me? Because we go through the same thing that the world goes through. The difference is he's with us every step of the way. He gives us hope. He gives us help. But we have to trust in him. And the more we trust in him, you, you know, like, like when we say, when we don't pray, you know what that's saying? Jesus said we should pray. In fact, when he taught on prayer, he didn't say if you pray. He said when you pray. Okay, so the implication was, well, you're, you're my followers, so you're going to pray. But you know the reason why a lot of times we don't pray? Because we're like telling God, God, I got this. I, I, don't, I, I got it. I got it. <laughs> I got it, Lord. And I've been watching Dr. Phil. I got this. I'm on it. And you know what happens? Then we come back to him. We've made such a mess. And we come back to him. Then we get mad because he doesn't straighten it out overnight. You took two years to get yourself in that jam. And you gave God two minutes to straighten it out. Now, he can do it. He can do it. But he's going to walk you back, and he's going to get you back on the right road, and he's going to lead you, and he's going to guide you. Man, we got to trust him. We have to have that childlike trust. How many of you, <laughs> many of you have ever just been racked by fear or worry or anxiety or frustration, and you just open God's word, and, and God's word says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. I'm going to do it. Close the book and go on your way. <laughs> no, we struggle with that, don't we? Because emotionally, we're not, we're not there yet, and we're frustrated. And we prayed about things before, and it didn't result the way that we wanted it to. I've been in situations like that. I look back over those situations that were the hardest. I didn't understand his plan, but I look back now, and I see that his plan was flawless. Can we get amen? <laughs> Give the Lord praise this morning, because he will definitely, guys, he will definitely turn it around. So now I'm, I've saved the best point for last, and here's one that we all struggle with, obedience. If you guys would just do what your pastor said, and quit giving me lip, your life would be so much better. Can I get amen? Not one. <laughs> Not one amen. <laughs> amen. Trust. Trust leads to humility, and humility will help us be obedient. If faith without works is dead, then the great expression of faith is just simple obedience to God's will and His Word. I mean, it's really, just make this simple. Read God's Word and do it. Now, I know you get into the Old Testament, you don't have to go in the backyard and butcher animals and sacrifice. I mean, don't worry about that. Get in the New Testament. Old Testament, there's a lot of good stuff in there. But that was God dealing with the nation of Israel. The New Testament is God dealing with the church. So we're the church. Who's the church? We're the church, right? So, so you get into God's Word, especially the Gospels. Just read what Jesus said, and then most of the rest of the New Testament was written by Paul, about half of it. It was written by the Apostle Paul, and they're just, they're just principles and truths of God's Word that you just learn to live. And there's such beautiful concepts, beautiful words of hope and encouragement. And the more that you obey, the more that you're blessed. You should write that down. Hashtag, the, the, more, the, more, the more that you obey, the more that you obey. But when we don't trust, 
God, I got this. I got this, God. No, I, I got this. I don't need to pray about this. I got this. Boy, man, that doesn't generally work out too well for me. Trust him. Trust the Lord with all of your heart and lean not to your own understanding. We see a great example of this. The first words that we read of Jesus in the New Testament, he goes to John, the Baptist, who many Bible teachers believe was his cousin. He goes to, to John the Baptist and to be baptized in water. And John the Baptist already realizes who he is, that he's the Messiah, and he doesn't want to baptize him. He said, I'm not worthy to baptize you. And here's what Jesus' response was to him. And Jesus said, it, it should be done, for we must carry out all that God requires. Other versions say, Jesus said, it is fitting to fulfill all righteousness. In other words, what Jesus was simply saying, I'll paraphrase this. This is my translation of it. We have to obey God in all things. But if there was anyone that could have cut corners and felt entitled to disregard certain aspects of God's word and God's plan, it would have been Jesus, but he didn't. He told his cousin, baptize me because I need I need to carry out all that God requires. So the more that you obey, the more that you trust, the more that you humble yourself, the more that you obey. I'm telling you, man, you follow these three principles and these three steps, this strategy for your life, God will pour out a blessing upon your life that you can't contain. You're welcome. Amen. Stand to your feet today and let's pray and be dismissed. Father, we just are so thankful for your presence. We're thankful, Lord, that Following you is simply a matter of simple trust that we just step out in faith and we believe you. Even though many times we, there are things that we don't understand that we can't see with our physical eyes, but faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And Father, as we leave this place, I pray God that this message will stay with us this week and every morning that we wake up, it's a new day and we can just determine that we're going to trust you throughout that day, not, not, stay up, not stay upset, not stay frustrated, not get angry uh, and, or stay angry. But yet, Father, we just simply trust and rest in you like a little child. You said, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven and help us to have that childlike trust, Father, that we can rest in you and live the life this amazing life that you have for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. You are dismissed.